Life is scarier when you know bad things could find you, when you don't know what they are. You're an absolute gem. Thank you for clicking on my suspect series. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today is about the victims of the redhead murders. Now, it's insane to me that serial killers like this can do things like this, but it's even more insane when the case is so mysterious that you're not even sure if they are one. And that confusing sentence about sums up this entire case. By the way, I'm posting so much more content like this, so if you would like to see more, please subscribe and let's get back to the story. Like I said, this case is like a bunch of puzzle pieces with similarities that don't quite go together. But from what I've found, the redhead murders are done by a serial killer named the Bible Belt Strangler. This man, or woman, has never been caught. They targeted redheads in the areas of Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia between October of 1978 through the 1980s and possibly continued until 1992. No one can say for sure because even the number of victims cannot be confirmed. But the first body was thought to be found on February 13th of 1983 along Route 250 in Littleton, Wetzel County, West Virginia. It was a white female between the ages of 35 and 45. She was about 5'6", weighed 135 pounds, and looked like a mannequin upon first glance when a couple of senior citizens came upon her. There was snow on the ground around her, but not her body, which led the investigators to believe that she had just been placed there and the footsteps and the marks made them also believe that she was killed elsewhere. She had two scars, one on her abdomen from a C-section and one on her index finger, and also had orange painted toenails and double pierced ears. She had not been sexually assaulted, but they could not find a cause of death, although they speculated that she had been strangled. There was also a white middle-aged man seen around the area around the same time, but he was never found, and neither was her identity. She became the Wetzel County Jane Doe. Nobody had a clue at this time that this could be a possible serial killer and had no reason to want to look at a possible MO, and it's hard to catch a killer that's constantly on the move. In September of that same year, another woman disappeared 10 hours from where Wetzel County Jane Doe's body was found. She was 20 years old, a redhead, and she had just found out she was pregnant. Her name was Nancy Lynn Blankenship. She disappeared from her home in Lavinia, Tennessee when she was doing holiday things. It was almost Christmas time and she was baking cookies. She was writing holiday cards. She was feeding her puppy and then she vanished. And the only lead that the investigators had to go on was a white car that a neighbor had seen in her driveway of her and her husband Ken's house that day. Then on September 16th of the next year, a woman's body was found an hour and 48 minutes away. It was found on Interstate 40 in West Memphis, Arkansas. And the body was found strangled and only wearing a sweater. Although it took the body about a year to be identified, they knew one thing for certain. It wasn't Nancy Blankenship. She had strawberry blonde hair, was a resident of West Virginia, and the only reason her body was identified was because a couple from Florida came forward saying she had stayed with them for a little bit and could identify her from there. Her name was Lisa Nichols or Jarvis, and the police believed because of the truck stop that was so close that she had been hitchhiking when this happened to her. Now, up to now, the murders had kind of been going a certain direction, but this next murder on January 1st of 1985 kind of backtracked eight and a half hours. Now, this body was found in Tennessee on Interstate 75. She was white and had curly, short, red hair. She was between 17 and 25 and was fully clothed when found. She was wearing a tan pullover, a shirt, and jeans, and she was two and a half to five months pregnant when she was murdered. She had freckles and a partial denture that was holding two of her top teeth of her upper jaw. She was between 5'1 and 5'4. She also was never identified and is known as the Campbell County Jane Doe. Then on March 6th, about an hour away in Knox County, Tennessee, 
the police got what they believed could be a, the biggest break in this case. They got a report from a woman named Linda Shack who said that she was strangled with her own shirt and then thrown onto Interstate 40 after this man thought that she was dead. She somehow survived and called to tell the police she knew who this man was and what he had done. His name was Jerry Leon Johns and he was a 37 year old truck driver. They arrested Jerry immediately and brought him in for questioning. They found the killer or so they thought. What they found was that Jerry had airtight alibis for the days when these women would have been murdered so they had to let him go. The police were then back to square one and the bodies were continuing to be found. Next was three and a half hours away in Cheatham County, Tennessee on March 31st where a skeletonized body was found. She was found on Interstate 24. She was white with red hair and was between five foot and five foot two. She was clothed in a shirt, sweater, pants, and underwear and was thought to be between 31 and 40. She had overcrowding and overlapping in her teeth and due to the condition she was found in, she could never really be identified, but they do have a hat that she was wearing that I'll put up on the screen now in case anybody recognizes it because she is still a Jane Doe as well. Just the next day on April 1st, another body was found in Knox County, Kentucky on Interstate 25 in a white Admiral refrigerator. This was the little town of Gray, which was a quiet, quaint place that literally had nothing ever happen and suddenly they had a woman who had been suffocated in a fridge on the side of the road. And the creepiest part of all was that there was a sticker on the front that said Superwoman. She was wearing two necklaces. One was a heart and one was a golden eagle. She was wearing two pairs of socks. One was white and one was white with green and yellow stripes. She also had moles on the right side of her neck her ankle, and below each breast. She had a yellow stained tooth, had red hair that had had a child and was between 24 to 35 and 49 to 411. At one point they thought that they found her identity as Ispy Regina Black Pilgrim due to that girl's daughter's description, but she is still a Jane Doe. And then on April 3rd, another body was found in Campbell County, only about four miles away from where the body was before. Although her looks could not be compared to the other victims because it had been a year to four years before she had been found. She was only 32 bones, including her skull. She had a necklace made of plastic buttons from clothing and she was only between 9 and 15. Tests showed that she was likely born in Florida or Texas and then relocated to the Midwest or the Rocky Mountains, the Southwest or the Pacific Coast, but she is also still a Jane Doe. 11 days after that, on April 14th, two hours away in Greenville, Tennessee, another body was found. It was face down and naked in the weeds. She was killed by blunt force trauma and it showed that right before her death she had had a miscarriage. She was 14 to 20, 5'4 to 5'6, had a slight overbite and fillings in her teeth. She also had pink painted fingernails and light brown to blonde hair with red highlights. A necklace with a penny on it was found next to her and fingerprints could be taken at this point because DNA was getting better, but she has still not been identified either. With all the bodies being found, the police from all of the states where the victims were came together to talk to the FBI to see if they could figure out what was happening and help them catch this possible killer. 10 days later, a six hour summit was held in Tennessee with all of the states there in attendance. But even after six hours there, it was still inconclusive. The deputy director in Tennessee said, while there are some similarities in the cases, there are also a great number of dissimilarities. And what he was talking about was that they weren't all true, full redheads and that they were also, some were clothed and some weren't, but they all were found next to highways. The bodies that they were connecting were all somewhat in the same area, but when they kind of expanded their search for more bodies, they found another one. They found the DeSoto County Jane Doe, who was found in DeSoto County, Mississippi. She was found on Route 78 in February of the same year that this was all happening. It would have actually been right after the first Campbell County Jane Doe was found. She was strangled to death like the others, she had strawberry blonde hair, and she was found around the same time. She could have been a victim as well, but they couldn't say for sure, just like they couldn't say for sure of all of the girls, but 
what they did do at this conference was rule out the four victims that had been found in Texas and one in Ohio that was the buckskin Jane Doe. They believed it very well could have been a truck driver doing these killings, killing the sex workers and the hitchhikers because it would be very easy to pick them up at rest stops and go on his way where nobody would see. Which could also be why the women are not being identified because they did not live in the same area where they were found. Also, the media played a huge part in that because they had very little to no coverage due to these women's possible lifestyle that they had and they didn't want anything to do with that and they didn't think that they deserved that coverage, which is absolutely inhumane. Nancy Blankenship, who was the woman who disappeared in the middle of all of this, was actually found nine years after the last body was supposedly found. In 1994, she was found in the Tennessee River and had an injury to her throat. And it was also found that she had only been in that river for five years when she had been missing for 11. It is still unknown, like a lot of things in this case, is if she is part of the redhead murder, and so is another body that was found in Haywood County on Interstate 40, right off of the Tennessee border. The body was found the same year as everybody else's in 1985 and she had strawberry blonde hair at the time of her murder. Her cause of death couldn't be determined like most of the other girls, but this Jane Doe finally did get her name. 27 years later, she was given her name once again, Priscilla Ann Levins. She had disappeared 10 years before her body was found in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in 2002, her sister asked for her DNA to be tested in the system. And when it was, it was a match to that Jane Doe. And with dental records, they proved that it was Priscilla. Even though there are still so many questions in her case and for the other Jane Doe's that I've talked about, her sister has something that I thought was so incredibly beautiful that made me want to share this case even more. She said, it is my hope that this tragedy for our family can somehow serve as a vehicle to let other folks know that miracles do happen and there is technology available. If your missing loved one is not in the DNA database, they need to get in there. It worked a miracle in my life and my family's life. They are still searching for Priscilla's murderer and if she's connected to the redhead murders and this entire case is still unsolved. A group of high school students actually t this year looked into this case more and decided to rename the whole case itself and the killer as the Bible Belt Strangler, which I'll get into why in a minute, but basically to get more attention on the case. And they worked with profilers and investigators to come up with the best possible profile for who they believe murdered these women. Profiling is one of my favorite parts of all of this and so I'm going to read you what they came up with and you can leave down below what you agree with, what you disagree with, but I just thought it was interesting what they came up with and the reasons for why they did. They said they believed that the killer was male because serial killers often target the opposite sex or who they have a sexual attraction to and also that women are more likely to kill people they know and these were very obviously random kills. They said he was born no earlier than 1962 and no later than 1936. It would put him no older than 48 at the time of the last murder and old enough to be able to kill at the first murder as well. And he would have had to be legal age to have possessed a commercial driver's license at the time to transport these bodies. He would have been between 5'9 to 6'2 and 180 to 270 in order to overpower the victims and kill them with his bare hands. He works or lives on Interstate 40 in Knoxville, Tennessee because this highway kind of goes through and then branches off from where the bodies were found. His motive to kill was mission-based over thrill or power, and there was also a sexual lust component in there due to the bodies being partially clothed and some of the victims. I was researching that thrill and power is more, you know, binding, rape, and torture, which was not found in these victims, whereas mission-based is to accomplish an end to help society, basically, which could have been why he targeted these sex workers, because he felt better than or wanted to get rid of them. And also the redhead aspect, if he didn't think that they were suitable to society, 
that could be why they targeted them. They believe he worked as a truck driver due to the constant traveling and movement. They believed he was white because all of his victims were, and it's usual for serial killers to kill people of their same race. And also African American truck drivers in the 1980s were very uncommon. They think that it was a possibility that he had long-term relationships because he was able to keep it organized and knew what he was doing and almost seemed like he had the mask of sanity that he could put on at any moment and lure victims in thinking that he was just a normal guy. They believe he might have driven an 18-wheeled semi or a commercial cargo transport in order to transport the victims. They believe he lived in a place called Bible Belt where 50% of adults are Christians which could have led to his hatred for prostitutes. They said that nowadays he would have scars from being so close to the victims when he killed them. He would also have high cholesterol from all the fast food that he ate while he was a truck driver and back problems and blood clots. He could have grown up in a very unstable home as a child with a father that was away all the time and a mother that he hated, which is why he targeted females. I also believe he had no history of mental illness, although he was mentally disturbed. It just wasn't recorded because, like I said before, he had the mask of sanity where he hid that from everybody. So that is what they said. Do you believe in that? Do you have any more theories as far as that? I mean, I am not a professional, but I, I kind of put in the ones that I believed more than the ones I didn't, and I kind of researched more into why they were saying that. And I mean, I think that it all sounds amazing to have that profile, and I hope that it helps and really gets this case going again that, you know, high schoolers are getting involved and want to get it solved. And this is just crazy to me that there are so many victims that haven't even been identified. I mean, maybe it means he did, you know, travel with them for a while before dropping their body and killing them. I don't know, but there has to be a reason. And I don't think just because they were sex workers that that's why they're Jane Doe's because people still care about other people regardless of what they do for a living because that is just what you were supposed to do. It doesn't matter what somebody does for money or does to survive. You should still love and support them. And I get that that's not the case every time, but you know, one of these Jane Doe's had to have someone that cared about them. And I just hope that one day, even though it seems impossible, it's still not. Just like with Priscilla, it was 37 years later and she got her name back so we can do this for the other Jane Doe's. So please share this with anybody or just share the pictures around of the Jane Doe's to try to get their faces out there again. And do you think that this case was actually a serial killer case or just a whole bunch of individual killings that somehow coincidentally went together? I don't know what I believe. I think that they're all very similar, but I get how, you know, if it's not perfectly similar, it's hard to say that it definitely is a serial killer. But I think either way, these women deserve justice, even if their families don't know what exactly happened to them. They still could be mourning and could have mourned for many, many years. And since these cases are all over the place, I'm going to give just the USA Crime Stoppers number in case you know anything and want to call in a tip. Their number is 1-800-222-TIPS. And I'll leave it down below too. My last question for you is, should I not have done this case or should I be scared because I am a redhead? I, I was intrigued by it because I am a redhead, but now I'm just kind of like, please don't kill me. <laughs> My heart's like racing. <laughs> I'll be fine. I'll pull it together. It's one that I hadn't seen anybody talk about. And I thought it was important because there are seven Jane Doe's and probably even more that we don't know about that need to have their name back. They deserve that. Please thumbs up if you want more content like this because I post so much and I would love your support on it. Please don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay. Bye. You can't prevent loss of life physically, but with fear, you lose that life mentally.